having never studied. Yeah. Jesus did not attend Bet Talmud. Okay? So, what would happen is a rabbi that was nearing the end of his ministry, he would come to Bet Talmud. He would come to that special class and he would choose a disciple. Did he choose the, the, the F students? The cream of the crop, right? The cream of the crop. He wanted an A student, right? The promising ones. And the goal of the rabbi was to reproduce himself in the disciple. And when the rabbi made his decision, he would stand before the student and he would say what? It's up on the screen. Come what? Who said that to? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Now, Jesus had a twist on this, right? The idea was that the disciple took on the life of their rabbi. Okay? So how did Jesus choose his disciples? Did he choose the cream of the crop? No. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Right? No, 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 no. The disciples that Jesus called were raw material. You understand that? All right? Their minds were not all, all already, you know, shaped and formed to think a certain way. These people were fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot. These were, you know, your every... Well, the tax collector wasn't an everyday person. He was pretty much hated by a lot of people, right? Okay. But think about it. He's pulling people out of everyday life. And he's saying to them, come, follow me. You see, they were not already set in their ways. You know, some people are like cement. They're all mixed up and set in their way. You understand that? Okay. You see, those disciples were still moldable. They were still teachable. Jesus could make them his disciples. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What was Jesus' goal in making disciples? It wasn't different than the rabbis. Notice what it says up on the screen. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, it says, A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is what? Perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Ah, yeah. Jesus' goal was to replicate himself in his disciples. How was he going to do that? It says by training them to be like him. That is making disciples. So rather than, you know, at the end of an effort, the end of a Bible study or something, and, you know, people are baptized, they join the church and all of that, rather than saying, okay, now, just calm down, you know, be like us or whatever, Rather than doing that, rather than dropping the effort, we need to pick up the effort. Is that understandable? And if I'm going to do that, I have to be intentional about it. Just like Jesus was intentional about it. All right. So, let's go a little deeper. Let's take this a little further, okay? How did Jesus make disciples? You have your Bibles, right? Okay, Mark, Mark chapter 3. Please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 13 through 15. 
Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. And it says this. And he went up on a mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12. Now pay attention. Then he appointed 12 that they might what? Be with him. That's right. And that he might send them out to preach and to have power, etc. That he might be with them. Okay? Jesus trained his disciples by association before sending them out. Now, why is that important? Matter of fact, this is a vital key to making disciples. It comes by being with the disciple. Now, that might seem obvious, okay? But I can tell you as a convert to the Adventist church, great to come to potluck. But if you're a single guy like I was, what happens the next Sabbath? Everybody goes their separate ways, and you're just sort of, okay, now what do I do? And a lot of people, you have to understand, a lot of people are not like you. When they come to this church, you know, they have to learn what it's like to keep the Sabbath. So, in today's society, you know, I mean, think about it. If they don't receive an invitation home or if there's not a potluck or or anything, how are they going to feed themselves? They go to the Golden Arches or something like that. You know, I had an interesting experience when, when I came into the church. And I was very fortunate. I'll tell you about Jerry and Gladys in a little bit, but I, I was very fortunate. But you know, you, you go through a learning process. And I, I can remember when, when I started to observe the Sabbath, I, that was a big thing for me. People told me, you need to celebrate the Sabbath. And I thought, that's great. You know, So on Sabbath morning, what I would do is I would go to my favorite diner And I would have a wonderful big breakfast and I would leave a wonderful tip and a a copy of Steps to Christ. And I thought I was doing great. You know, we're celebrating the Sabbath. And and when I get to church, people notice that I had a toothpick in my mouth. And they blew the whistle. Foul! And the pastor came over to my apartment. Eddie. Eddie. Is everything okay? Yeah, it's great. Eddie, is everything okay? And he sort of hemmed and hawed all through, you know, and it's like, and I just said, dude, speak up. What's on your mind? You came over here for a reason. I am from New York, so I'm very direct. So, you know, I've mellowed out a lot. I've, you know, I've lived in Iowa and Missouri for a long time. I've mellowed out. Okay? But uh, I still have that. I still have that edge. So you'll have to forgive me if it comes out every once in a while. But he said, yeah, Eddie, you know, some of the ladies from church, you know, they notice, you, you know, you have a toothpick in your mouth. And, you know, are you going out to eat somewhere on Sabbath morning? And we got to talk about it. See, but what did I know? You tell me to celebrate, and I think celebrate is always connected with food. Okay? Yeah. I'm glad he came to visit me. You know that? I'm really glad. And it didn't come up like, oh no, you can't make him a deacon. He eats out on Sabbath. See what I mean? Okay? 
Am I knocking on your noggin a little bit this morning? Making you think about these things? It's very important. Jesus trained his disciples by association. Being with them. Them being with him. Being with Jesus was their primary means of learning how to minister friends. He spent quality time with his disciples, pouring his life into theirs. Now, I have to just say, you know, we, we need to be practical about this, you know, to, to, to a great degree because, you know, we're not saying to new people that join the church, why don't you just move in with me? Why don't you just move in with us? We've got a spare bedroom. You know, this is usually not the way we approach things, right? Okay, you have to remember, we're talking about, we're talking about how Jesus did things 20 centuries ago, right? But there's principles involved here. Principles that we can extract and learn from and intentionally implement. And I can tell you, from the time that I really began to take this seriously, 15 years ago or so, up until now, as I move from one church to the next, I have seen a remarkable difference. I have seen the retention level go up. You know what retention is, right? The keeping of new people go up. There's one, there's one pastor, he was in this conference, I won't name him, he was in this conference. Everywhere this guy would go, I mean, he would give Bible studies. He would have evangelistic meetings. Every church that he pastored grew. And as soon as he left, guess what happened? Yeah. Why? Well, him and I got to talk about that. They got so attached to him and not attached to the people that once he left, that was it. Because he was their relationship. He was their association. I don't know how he ever did it. Brothers and sisters, it's up to us, us, to step up and take this seriously. Why? Because it's the commission that Jesus gave to us, isn't it? To go and do what? Make disciples and baptize them. Okay? All right. So Jesus modeled the life and they learned to imitate him. How many of you, you know, some of you are tradesmen, some of you, I mean, you remember maybe starting off as an apprentice, okay? When I graduated from high school, I also attended a vocational school, and I was an auto mechanic. And they just didn't say, hey, do that complicated job over there, you know? I learned from the experienced mechanic, you see? And so when I wasn't doing an oil change or changing a tire or, you know, doing those common things, he would call me over and he would show me, this is how you do this. This is how you test this. And I learned. I don't know how many of you have been an apprentice under somebody at one time or another. Yeah, see, several of you are raising your hands. You learned from somebody else, didn't you? You, 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 you got alongside of them. And that's what Jesus did. And that, friends, is an essential component, an essential principle of discipleship. So what's the first one? Be intentional, right? Intentionality. The second one, association. Very good. Thank you. Somebody's taking notes. Wonderful. Or you have a good mind. All right. Very good. So what was Jesus' understanding of a disciple? Okay? He called that motley crew of men, and there were women there too, right? Okay? So what was his understanding of a 
disciple. First of all, a disciple is a person who responds to the call of Christ. People will come to Jesus just as they are. <laughs> All right? Just as they are. You know, when I, as I have moved from, from church to church, I challenge my churches. I say this. Do you want to be a museum for the saints or a hospital for sinners? Now, you all know the right answer to that, right? You all know the right answer. But in all practicality, is that what you do? I tell my churches, watch out. Because if you start saying, I want to be a hospital for sinners, I want to be that, guess what's going to happen? You better admit that you're the first sinner walking in the door. And that everybody else that comes in that door is searching to be healed. You understand what I'm talking about? And boy, I'll tell you what. I have one church right now, and you better not go and tell them this. You better not go and tell them I'm talking about them. But it's true. I had one church that they were a museum for the saints. And you know what? They were getting older. And I don't know if they were getting more saintly. But they were getting older and older and more and more to themselves. And their world was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And any outreach depended on what that pastor was going to do. So for many years, they had these young guys with wet, you know, wet behind the ears. And guess what? They expected them to do everything. Woo! <laughs> you know... Yeah, well, then along came me. Things are different now. I'll just put it that way. Things are different now. It's because the idea of being a hospital for sinners got in their hearts. Because that's what Jesus was. Wasn't he the great physician? Right? And I'm telling you, God has brought some broken people to our church. And they have loved them. They have accepted them just as they are. And there have been some critical moments when they had to face exactly what they wanted to be. Let me give you an example. One of our elders invited a guy to come and preach and this guy comes and he preaches and he preaches about Paul you know uh, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks you know that you know his conversion right on the road to Damascus and everything and he's going on about that and all of a sudden from his suit jacket he pulls out a piece of paper and he begins to tell all the things that are wrong with the Adventist church and one of the things that were wrong with our church is that we are not coming dressed properly to church. So we should have a wardrobe downstairs of suits and dresses. So if somebody does not come dressed properly to church, they can go downstairs, they can select a suit, they can select a dress and be dressed properly for church. How would you like that preached? Maybe some of you would like that. Look, when you have broken people coming to your church, they come as they are. So I caught wind of it. I called him up and I said, can you send me a copy of your sermon and that piece of paper you pulled out of your suit jacket? Uh, 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 uh. He eventually sent it, sent it to me. And I put it in front of the elders. And I said, is that what you want preached here? 
is that what you want preached here? And they said, no. I said, good, because if that's what you want preached, you can have him come on Sabbath. I'll stay in Davenport. Because that's not where I'm at. You see, I was once a very broken person. And there were some Christian people who embraced me and loved me and discipled me. So what's your church all about? Are you a museum for the saints? Or are you a hospital for sinners? You know the right answer. But being that hospital, being the place where people can come and be healed and find Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So, I told you before I started, I was going to challenge you a little bit. I haven't poked you too hard, have I? <laughs> All right. Now, so a person responds to the call of Christ. Secondly, a person is transformed by Christ. You see a change take place, right? Uh, attitude, I mean, I, I can tell you about Charlie. Charlie came to an evangelistic meeting. John Bradshaw and I, you know John Bradshaw from It Is Written. John and I were holding a series of meetings. And Charlie would come to the meetings. And Charlie would come drunk. And Charlie, boy, he gets a few drinks in him, man. That, I mean, his tongue lets loose. And he does nothing but talk. So my job was to take Charlie aside and let Charlie talk to me while John could visit with other people because Charlie would take up all the, you know, all the attention. And so he would come first night, second night, third night, fourth night, fifth night. And we thought, man, you know, and, and we, I mean, we did pray for him, but it wasn't like, you know, we were praying and fasting for him. I can admit that. But night six or seven, he wasn't drunk anymore. There was a noticeable change. And he was listening. Guess what happened? Something got through whatever level of alcohol he had in him, whatever impairment of his mind, the gospel got through to him. Yeah. And Charlie was transformed by Christ. It wasn't anything that we did. We didn't persuade him. We didn't twist his arm. We didn't do any of that stuff. Christ came. And he opened the door of his heart and Charlie was changed. Raw material, but changed. Thirdly, a person has a new purpose in Christ. You know, you can always tell when a person has a new purpose. They say, what can I do? Is there somewhere where I can serve? Can I help you with that? Isn't that cool? You ever see that? Yeah, we have a guy right now, Jason. And believe me, Jason comes from a rough background. These are broken people. And Jason now has made a transition in his mind that rather than sitting in the pew, he's going to do something. He wants to contribute. Isn't that cool? He wants to contribute. So you know what? We told him. We need AV people. You know what AV means? Audio, visual, right? And so one of our elders, Dwayne, has taken Jason under his wings and he's showing him how to run the soundboard. Yeah, you know, it's like that one time. It? He put it up too high and the thing went, Rawr! you know how that goes? Rawr! You know? And it's like, Rawr! okay. But we all smiled, amen? He's learning. Yeah, he has a new purpose in his life. He wants to contribute. 
Isn't that cool? I mean, I just love it. I just love it. So I want you to give, some, I want you to give, uh, give this some real thought here. How does Jesus' description of becoming a disciple challenge your idea of becoming a church member or relating to guests? How many of you have asked this question? Okay, you're going through an evangelistic series or somebody's, you know, I mean, you know, you're working with this interest and somebody comes up and says, are they a member yet? Hmm? Have, have they joined the church yet? You know, we want to know that. You know, like that's, like that's some kind of a goal. Wait a minute. Why aren't you asking, are they a disciple yet? Are they a follower of Jesus yet? See? It's different. It's different. And by the way, in uh, our churches, we do not call new people visitors. Scrap that word. Get rid of it. You visit a museum. And if you visit a museum once, are you most likely to go back again? No. We call them guests. It's a different way of looking at things. But it's an important way of looking at things. Because if somebody is coming to your church, and they've come for five weeks, six weeks, whatever, and you're still saying, oh, it's so good to have you visiting with us again. Doesn't it sound a lot better to say, be our guest? Hmm? It doesn't matter how long somebody's been attending your church and you say, you're a guest. You're welcome here. It's a more welcoming word. And, and, and I'll say this, folks. There are things that worked in the 1960s that don't work anymore. You've got to change some things if you want to be more effective. I'll give you, let, let, let's, let's do this. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. I brought Bill to church with me one Sabbath, okay? And the pastor was up front saying, you know, after services today, we are having a potluck. Now, that's a pretty common word here in the Midwest, but not in New York. He said, we're going to have a potluck after church today. And Bill's countenance just fell. And I noticed. And I said, Bill, something bothering you? No, 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 sorry. You want to stay for potluck? No. So, of course, church ended and, you know, everybody's getting up out of their pews and, and all that. And I said, Bill, you've got to tell me, what's bothering you, man? He goes, you guys gamble? <laughs> you get it? No. <laughs> That's a word for, like, the church dinner, you know. Everybody just kind of brings, and whatever's there, that's what you partake of. Or how many of us say, hey, come and join us for haystacks. And people don't know what that is. They think of a haystack, you know, in the middle of a field, you know. What is that? You can explain by saying it's like a taco salad. Ah! Now you think that's pretty simple. Well, let me tell you, it's those simple things that make a difference. You've got to be able to communicate with people where they're at, okay? So, so how does Jesus' description of becoming a disciple challenge your idea of becoming a church member? Think about it. You were baptized, you joined the church, right? But did you ever become a disciple of Jesus? How does the Lord's description of discipleship challenge your own experience? Have you been discipled? 
My sermon this morning is, um, the title of it is, Do You Want Them to Thrive or Just Survive in the Church? What's your answer? <laughs> yeah, right? Okay. I mean, think about it. Who has been an influential person in your life? Who has really helped you to know Jesus? I mean, it might be your parents. Maybe you had godly parents. Praise the Lord. You know? Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was, you know, one of your elders here or somebody, you know, who took you under their wings and, and helped you navigate the Christian life, and particularly the Adventist Christian life. I had two people that helped me quite a bit, Jerry and Gladys. Jerry and Gladys Martinez. I went to a small, a small Spanish church in New York. There was probably 50 people at the most that attended that church. And we crammed in that little storefront of a church. <laughs> oh, a lot of good memories there. And Jerry and Gladys were the ones who took me under their wing. It was Jerry who followed up on what my aunt told him. My aunt said to Jerry, Eddie's interested in studying the Bible. You need to go and talk to him. And so Jerry came to my apartment Now, you have to understand, I did not know that Jerry had become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. What I knew of Jerry was that he was a Casanova. You know what that means? Okay, I don't have to describe that to you. If I have to describe that to you, come and talk to me later. That's what I knew. And all of a sudden, there's Jerry. I open the door, and there's Jerry. And I'm looking him up and down. I said, Jerry, what are you doing here? <laughs> he goes, well, uh, he says, uh, Mamita, that's what, we called our, that's what we called my aunt. Mamita says you're interested in studying the Bible. I am? Huh? Maybe I am. I don't know. Come in. And yeah, I had some, you know, religious questions, you know. But one thing that Jerry did was he led me to Jesus. He opened the scriptures and he introduced me to Jesus. And that was cool. Because all I knew growing up is that Jesus is this guy hanging on a cross over here, you know, on, on one side of the church. And he doesn't look like he can help me at all. He looks like he needs my help. You see what I mean? See, we want to, let me, let me, if, do you mind if I just digress for a minute? I'm going to do it anyway, so, but, you know. Um, look, we would like to have a Bible study with a person that's pretty near to what we're like. Okay? And... We would like to have a Bible study where we can just do Daniel 2, Signs of the Times, and, and you know, all these common studies that we do with people and that they become an Adventist. You know what I'm finding a lot? As I'm out studying the Bible with people, as I'm out following up on interests or whatever, I find that people are becoming biblical, biblically illiterate. Okay? You can't expect them to open their Bible to Daniel chapter 2 like that. They've never even opened a Bible. They don't even know there's a table of contents there. They know that grandma used to take them to church when they were little. You know, and they get little papers. You know, that kind of a thing. For a lot of people, their Christian experience is a fading memory if there's one there at all. 
So I've switched. I don't, I don't start off with Daniel 2. If I'm studying the Bible with somebody, I want to introduce them to the Bible. Why do we call the Bible the Word of God? See? And then why did Jesus die for me? Basic stuff. We've got to reach people where they're at, you know? We've got to disciple people where they're at. And believe me, there are people that come walking into our church and, and, and they don't know anything. They just, they, they picked up on something or they saw and they met an Adventist person somewhere. There was one guy who came into our church and he said, I met, I met an Adventist guy in, in Sacramento, California. He seemed like a nice person, so I thought I'd come and visit the church. Welcome. Be our guest. See? Yeah, I love it. I love it. My, my wife asked me when I was going to retire. I said, I don't know, dear. I think I'm just tired. I don't know about being retired. You know? I don't know. <laughs> okay? But think about this. Who's been an influential person in your life? Jerry and Gladys were influential in my life. And I'm glad for that. I don't know how that would have steered me in my experience with God. I don't. I don't know, but I'm so glad that they were there. And they would invite me home for Sabbath dinner. They would hang around with me. And believe me, at one point, man, I was at their house every night for three hours a night. I was hungry. How would you like to have somebody at your, how would you like to have me at your house every night for three hours a night? You'd like that? Do you wash dishes? Do I wash dishes? I didn't wash any dishes. I ate. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, boy, I was really hungry. And they put up with that. And they were kind to me. And I appreciated it. It wasn't like, oh, dear, we, need to, we, we, we better go to bed so this person can go home. You know, no. See, the challenge to us is to start associating with guests or new people and disciple them. That's the challenge to us. There needs to be what I call a gravitational pull. You see, we tend to gravitate toward our circle of friends, the people that we're comfortable with, rather than to be attracted to the guests and the new members. It's very difficult to break into those circles. It, it, it is. It's hard for people to navigate a new community. We need to help them. We need to open up our circles and say, why don't you join us? Why don't you come hang out with us? You know? No. Yeah. And you know, one thing you'll find out is that new people are not so sleepy on Sabbath afternoon. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They're hungry, you know? A lot of them are hungry. And God has put you in a place to influence them, to influence them for good. So there needs to be a gravitational pull, right? We need to start associating with these people. And it's a hard thing, I know, to pull yourself away from the people that you're used to being with and give attention to somebody that you've never met before. But you need to do it. For the gospel's sake. Because Jesus has called you to take the gospel to the world. Jesus has called you to go and make disciples of all nations. And the last time I checked, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and the surrounding vicinity here where you all live is part of the world. The last time I checked, okay, yeah, all right, <laughs> all right. Now, 
up on the slide here, I want you to just get, get a, a snapshot of discipleship in the early church. It was an important component of evangelism in the New Testament. You can see it all the way through, friends. Matter of fact, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, the word disciple or some derivative of it shows up 261 times. The weight of evidence is there. Okay? So this was an important component. Is it an important component of when you guys do evangelism? All right. Some sobering thoughts. Evangelism's most persistent enemy is poorly planned and poorly executed discipleship. And church conflict runs a close second to that. Yeah. Um, when you hold an evangelistic meeting, I don't know how you do it. But you know, you get all worked up and the evangelist comes and he preaches a wonderful sermon to you and builds up your confidence. Okay, we can bring somebody to this meeting or whatever. Or maybe you totally depend on the brochure. I have no idea what you do here. I don't keep track of your church. I have enough to keep track of. But if discipleship is not incorporated into the experience, we're going to continue to put people on our books and allow them to fade into the past. And then somebody looks at your church and says, oh, you guys have 375 members or whatever it is. But then you have 100, 120 attending. And I come back to that song, where have all the converts gone? Long time passing, when will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? Okay. And believe me, new people can pick up on church conflict, that there's a conflict, there's a vibe. You don't understand what a vibe is? Something just seems to be unsettled. Something has robbed people of the vitality and the vibrancy of their Christian experience. And people can tell that. And always remember this. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? Whatever your heart is full of, it's going to come out. And somebody who has a conflict... It's hard to say nice things. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So a high priority rests on us to develop a discipling ministry which fully cares for the new believer. And that's why we call it life to life. Okay? Because it is the most effective way of discipling. And I tell people, look, you know... Yeah, I'm going to win souls for Christ. I'm going to share. I'm going to baptize people and like that. But I would rather baptize six people and disciple them and integrate them into the church and help them to be, you know, strong believers than to, bap than, than, than to hold an evangelistic meeting, baptize 20 people, and lose them all except two in the end. You understand what I'm talking about? All right. So you guys, not too long ago, had an evangelistic series, right? Didn't you? Didn't, didn't uh, Scott um, Hawkinson have somebody come and do an evangelistic series for you? No? Okay. I'm thinking of something else. Who did it? Okay. So where are those people? Where are the people who were baptized? See? This is what I'm talking about. All right? So the work of evangelism is never complete until the evangelized 
the discipled, becomes the evangelizer. All right? So there is a cycle that people go through. All right? And I want to talk to you a little bit about this because Ellen White called this the golden moment. When people come to your church, when they walk into your church for the first time, they come as an observer. They're watching. They're looking. What is this place like? Am I comfortable? See? They come to observe. And if they like what they see, or they like what they feel or experience, guess what happens? They start attending. Exactly. They start attending. Now, um, I don't know what you do with, you know, first-time guests, and maybe some of you are first-time guests. I don't know, but... Um, one of the things that we want to make sure of that, that we connect with people who are guests at our church. And so what we do is we have a welcome folder. Okay, so if you come to either one of my church, or I don't want to say they're not my churches, but you understand when I say, when I say that, what I mean. When you come to either one of the churches that I pastor, you will get a welcome folder. And inside the welcome folder are some neat stuff. And so from, you know, during the announcement time, I'll say if you are a first time guest, you should have received a welcome folder. That is a gift from us to you. Inside that welcome folder is a card. If you will fill out that card and put it in the offering plate, that will help us to get better acquainted with you. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, people aren't going to give their information. You want to bet? Oh, I don't bet. So, excuse me. That's... <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? People fill these out, and they give you their address, they give you their email address, they give you their phone number, they even tell you how many kids they have and what their ages are. And believe me, since we incorporated this about six years ago, I have a stack about that thick. And you know what that tells me when somebody fills out that card and puts it in the offering plate? You know what that tells me? Contact me. Get a hold of me. I want to be known. Forget about the guest book. I don't know what you have here. And I told you, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Get rid of the guest book. It's not a sacred cow. You understand what I'm saying? It's not sacred. If you have people come to your church and say, would you please sign our guest book? And I would put Eddie Cabrera, Davenport, Iowa. I would try to do it as quickly as I can. Okay, so you know what my name is and where I'm from. How are you going to get a hold of me? Or if it's you know, Jane Doe, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Okay, Go try to find Jane Doe. But if Jane Doe fills out a card and puts it in the offering plate, they're saying, contact me. Get a hold of me. I want to be known. You get it? And yeah, we have some neat stuff in here. We have a Steps to Jesus. We have a, uh, a bulletin insert on our, our radio station. And we have an information sheet inside. On one sheet of paper is all the stuff happening at our church. Okay? So if Jane has two 
kids, a boy and a girl that are Pathfinder age, guess what's on here? Our Pathfinders, ages 10 to 16, meets the first and third Sunday mornings of the month. Talk to Ben Baher. And we let them know what's happening at our church. Bill, this is for you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So people come to your church for the first time. Here's a guest. They walk in the front door. I don't know what happens here. Okay, I was here at 9 o'clock, so I know what happens at 9 o'clock. I don't know where. No, I won't go there. All right. But anyway, so you come as an observer, and Ellen White said that's the golden moment. Okay? But then if they like what they see, if they have a good experience, they'll be attending your church. That is the place where you want to intersect with them. You want to get to know them. If they're a repeat customer, if I can put it that way, um, you know, I mean, do you think you got a live fish on the line? I don't know how many of you are fishermen, but all right. So, so they come as an observer. They start attending church. And you know what? If they're attending church, that means that they are interested and they are a what? They're searching. Okay? Now, in Davenport, we have Palmer College. You know, it's a chiropractic college. And we have people that come in and out of there all the time. So we have Kevin from Canada. But Kevin has shared his faith with Joel. And now Joel is coming to church. And guess what? I'm communicating with Kevin. Kevin, what's happening with Joel? What's going on? All right, I'm getting the thing. You know what that means? I'm running out of time. And you know, really, I'm only halfway through my presentation, Bill. <laughs> yeah, all right. But here's what we do. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, but here's what we do. From the time that I leave my home and walk across the parking lot to the church, I have prayed and I have asked God to give us a miracle. And I ask my members, before you get out of the, before you get out of the car, would you please pray for a miracle? How many of you prayed for a miracle before you got out of the car this morning? Not likely, because you didn't have any expectation that anything would happen. And you're saying, God, leave me alone. I just want to have a regular Sabbath. Whatever that means. But I ask my people, pray for a miracle. Before you get out of your car, ask God for a miracle. And let me tell you something. There's, I don't think there's a Sabbath that goes by, and particularly in Davenport, I don't think there's a Sabbath that goes by that we don't have a guest. God does answer the prayers of his people, friends. And I can tell you that if you're discipling New believers, if you're discipling interest and they're having a good time, they're getting to know Jesus, guess what's going to happen? They're going to witness to others. They're going to tell others. And so here you are, you're thinking you're adding somebody to your church. Actually, God is working by multiplication. You understand that? We work by addition. God works by multiplication. I love it. Sorry. I love it. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on. So here's the big question. You know, are people being attracted to Jesus because of who I am? Wow. 
Wow. All right. I got the thing, you know. You know what that means, right? So I better quit here. Maybe quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you for giving me your attention this morning. This is so very important. And in closing, I want to tell you why it's important. This is a, this is a book that I hope that you will read. You can get it on Amazon. It's out there. It's called Already Gone. Already Gone. Why are the churches in England empty today? You know those big cathedrals, right? And all that stuff. Why are they empty? Where are the people? Where are the young people? They've been evangelized by a secular society. The author of this book, you know who Ken Ham is? He's the guy that has the ark, you know, out in Kentucky. Okay, all right. Um, he's the one that authored this book. And he said the same thing that happened in England is happening here. Slowly, slowly. Already gone. Good book to read. If you value your young people, please read that. Now, because I had to cut my presentation short, um, in your bulletin today, there are, there are uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six points. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Used to be seven. Uh, there are six points here that if your church practices this or you practice this in discipling a new believer, you've got a winning combination. Your retention level will go up. Okay? I'm sorry we didn't get to go through these points this morning, but um, this presentation, Bill, I'm going to give this to you. And so you can go through this with your church. Anybody who's, who's interested in discipling can go through this. There's, I, like I said, I only went through half of it this morning but uh, and if uh, anybody's wondering what Ellen White had to say about it um, are, do we do we have two deacons there's one and there's two all right very good I thought maybe the, the deacons would not volunteer there for a minute <laughs> if you would hand that out on this side and if you would take care of it on this side you'll see the priority that Ellen White gives to discipleship, okay? All right, thank you very much um, for giving me your time and attention this morning. I really appreciate you giving up the Sabbath school study to listen to me. <laughs> um, and I hope that you have found this to be valuable.